Good morning, everyone. To welcome you to Bream Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Again, we're located in Evansville, Indiana, P.O. Box 6033. And on the bottom here is my phone number. If you have any comments, please text me. More information, our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. Facebook, Grace Life Church and or Bream Bible Church. And we do have a Rumble account in it. You get on our website or Facebook, the videos link back to YouTube, so subscribe and all that cool stuff. On Wednesdays, we're going through a, you know, I call it Grace Life Unleashed podcast, and it's playing chess in a checkers world. And we start out with economic issues, current event things, and then we go into a, a Bible study, and we're going through Romans, although we've been jumping around a little bit and things like that lately. We're actually getting more views on our Wednesday than we are on our, I don't know why, on our Sunday service. I think a lot has to do with titles sometimes more than anything else. He put a goofy title on it sometimes drives people. So once in a while if you wonder, why is he calling it that? And it, it's for no reason. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes the titles make sense. And sometimes I look at a title or what I wrote a couple days later and I went, I can't imagine nobody corrected my spelling yet because I, I always have spelling problems. Robin, that's your job. <laughs> She's like, I'd be texting you all day then. But anyway, so I want to start out this morning. We're going to do a little bit of a, a intermediate special lesson on what did Paul teach when he went into the synagogues after Acts 9? So I'm going to start out with a question. When Paul went into the synagogue after Acts 9, and this is an actual quote, didn't come from me. Um, this is what this pastor said. He told the Jews that they now had to be saved the same way the Gentiles were saved. He explained to those Jews the grace message. In other words, he explained the grace message to them. Do you think that is a true statement or a false statement? Don't answer me because it doesn't matter. I, I believe that's a false statement, but the pastor, the pastor who said that felt that was a true statement. And the majority of my saved life, and I'm going to go back actually to this, majority of my saved life, I actually believe that too. Even though I struggled with the book of Acts when Paul would go into the synagogue, and I was always told, Dave, 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 Acts is a transitional book, and the body of Christ is ramping up, and the kingdom church is ramping down, and it's just a hodgepodge, a mess. And I looked at that and I went, why can't we understand it? And it took me a long, long time because, yes, and the word right here is diminishing. I don't know if you can see that for those of you at home. But it's the kingdom program being diminished or set aside. And if you look down here, not that charts are, are inspired, um, but it says Acts 28 here. And uh, that is when officially I believe that you were not allowed to be saved into the kingdom program anymore. Up until Acts 28. When Paul would go into the synagogues, and we're going to show this over the next few weeks. We're not going to quite get to it today. When Paul would go to the synagogues, and again, who hung out in synagogues? Did Gentiles hang out in synagogues? And the answer is, well, it's possible they did. But as a whole, who hung out in synagogues? Jews. Okay, Jews. Now, let me take it one step further. Do you think the little flock, or those who believe Christ was the Messiah, who were waiting for Christ to come back and set his kingdom up. Do you think those folks hung out in synagogues? No. no. Why not? Because what would have happened to them? They would have kicked them out. Yeah. And that's why Paul went you know, to Damascus, was to find those people and to throw them in prison. But he wasn't going to the synagogues to find them because those people weren't hiding more than anything else. Those were the, you know, the little flock. So I look at this and I go, okay, why can't other grace pastors see this if I can see it and what the place I had to come to was I had to come to the conclusion and they go Dave this is some deep stuff that the two programs were going along side by side and yes when Paul went to the Jews and talked to the Jews they were put into the kingdom program up until Acts 28 there were people being saved into the kingdom program Jewish people and what happened after Paul went in the synagogue after a couple weeks? Remember, what did, did the Jews do to him? Kicked him they kicked him out and wanted to kind of kill him, right? Now, were those, were those the kingdom saints that wanted to kill him? No, those, weren't, those were the people Paul used to work for, let's say, okay? They wanted Paul dead, too. So we have three groups that we're playing with here. We have grace believers, we have kingdom saints, and we have those Jews, <laughs> the Judaizers, we want to call them, that wanted them all to go away, okay? 
They were the religious people more than anything else. So I, I consider this to be a false statement. And then we throw on top of that um, some of the grace pastors out there that said, after Acts 9, anybody who was alive was put into the body of Christ, whether they wanted to be or not. And then it becomes a really big mess. And, and that's why I think the grace movement just needs some clarification on this. And so I'm going to write a book, and you're going you're to get sick of me saying this because this is going to take over a year or longer. <laughs> okay? Because it just is, but every, every week I write more and more and more, and then it's going to have to be edited, and that's the part I don't like. Because um, if you want to be my editor, the first thing you have to know is what I wanted to say. Not what I did say, but what I wanted to say. <laughs> That's the problem. No one wants to work for free anymore. <laughs> yeah. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write these, and I'm going to go through and edit it myself, and then edit it again and again and again. And finally, way to get to the point to where, to where it's not too embarrassing to me, <laughs> then I'll let other people look at it. Yes? Right, when you do your, I, I add words and put correct spelling in everything I write. <laughs> I know what I meant to say. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, why didn't I see that? Because your mind plays tricks on you. Anyways, words mean things. And that has to do in scripture too. And in Acts, it says things. Words are meaningless without intent and follow through. And that, that's important when we get to the book of Acts. But we're going to go all the way back to Genesis. And here's the first thing we're going to discuss. The, did God always hate Gentiles. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? He never, always, he never did. He never did. God always had a plan for Gentiles. In fact, before Abraham, where we had the first you know, Jewish person, everybody was a Gentile. Okay? There, there were no Jews and Gentiles. It was just people. The first distinction God ever made was in Genesis when God picked one particular person. And this is what he said in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Okay, So this is the, the first thing that God told Abram. And he didn't pick Abram because Abram was this amazing person who was already walking right. I think he did. God just picked him. I don't know why. He just picked him. Because I believe at this time, there was not a single person on the earth who was saved. Everybody had walked away from God. You know, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. I think that's what Paul's talking about when he talks about that. And I think Romans 1 takes place right here, too. To where God had taken the plan of salvation and made it so simple. and says, just believe that there's a creator and you're saved. Okay? Now, is that our plan of salvation? No. no, no. no. So when will that have taken place? I think it was, you know, about this time and probably from the Tower of Babel going forward. But what had man done? Rather than worshiping the creator, they worship the what? The creation. Yeah, the creature. You know, rather than the creator. And that's what God said. Just, just believe in a God. Look at nature. Don't you want to believe in a God? Oh, no, no, You know, that's how goofy man is, okay? Now, this is what God told Abram. I will make of thee a great nation. And that's the nation of what? Israel, right? Okay, I'm going to make you a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, now. Has this fully happened yet? No, no. Do we see a taste of it during, you know, yes. during the kingdom program? During, yeah, I, I think we did. Yeah, the little flock. We saw a taste of it even in Abraham's life. I mean, Abraham had the touch of Midas. Everything he touched just turned out good. You know, it was amazing how you know, God just took care of him. Now, verse 3. And I will bless them. Now, Here's always the question. Is the them his family? No. I, yeah, right. I think it goes beyond that. It has to do with what? Anyone. Which would be now Gentiles. Okay? Because now we have Israel, which is Abraham, and we have everyone else. So he's saying, I'll bless everyone else, and I'll curse everyone else, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so if you go back to, you know, I will make of thee a great nation... He's basically saying, guess what, okay? If these other people bless you, you're going to get the same, they're going to get the same blessings that you have. And so what God is basically telling Abraham is, there's always going to be a plan of salvation for others as long as they understand that Abraham is the cool guy in town, okay? He's the one you want to hang around with, okay? 
If you understand who Abraham is and you are nice to him, God will be nice to you. If you're nasty to Abraham, then God's going to be nasty to you. Now, there's a lot of people today, there's even a lot of denominations, big name denominations that look at that verse and go, that's true today too. And that's why we have to take care of Israel because if we take care of Israel, God's going to take care of America. Now, why do we, why are we friends with Israel? Anybody know? They're our allies. We agree with them. Okay, that's why. Not because we're expecting God, but a lot of people are expecting God now to bless us because we're taking care of Israel. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure America politically even likes Israel. Somehow, once in a while, it's like, really? Yeah. So, all the families, which would be all the other families, which at this time, at that time was families, now we're going to use the word nations. Okay? In thee, through Israel, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, has that happened yet? <laughs> we saw a taste of it, you know. It's going to fully happen in the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom. During the thousand-year kingdom, if you acknowledge that Israel is the, you know, the head, and you're second class, I guess you could say, um, God's going to bless you, here, get this once, as much as he blesses Israel. You know that? You will lack nothing. But if you go, no, no, I'm not, I'm not blessing Israel, guess what? You're probably going to be dead, Okay. He'll probably kill you. That's how things work. So, did God have a plan to save Gentiles? He always did. In every dispensation, there has always been a plan for Gentiles. Now, jump ahead. The time of Christ is walking the earth. He told the Jews not to go to the Gentiles, or he should say he told the twelve, don't go there. He also said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why didn't Christ go to the Gentiles? Does anybody know? What was the reason? Because there's a reason. It was it because he didn't like them? Because the scripture says that salvation is of the Jew. There you go. When Christ came to the earth, what James says, the scripture says salvation is of the Jew. When Christ came to the earth, he came to the nation of Israel, which was supposed to be a nation of priests. Okay? Our kingdom of priests. And of kings and priests. And the point is, Israel was supposed to be a priest, and the priest is an intermediate person between God and man. If the whole nation is a priest, who are they, I always like this word, who are they priesting to? <laughs> okay? Gentiles, okay? So it wasn't that Christ didn't like Gentiles, but he came to the Jews and said, guys, start doing your job. But what did the Jews think of the Gentiles? Anybody know? They're dogs, they're second class citizens. And really, we don't like them. We want nothing to do with them. We're not going to talk to them. And the last thing we're going to do is, is talk to them about their salvation. They really liked the fact that they were all going to the lake of fire. That didn't bother them one bit. Case an example, read the book of Jonah. Okay? The reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because those were the enemies of God, and they were Gentiles. And as far as Jonah was concerned, they didn't deserve salvation. And he knew God was a God of mercy and kindness, and he was going to save them. And he didn't want that, so he went the other way. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's really what it was. So how do you motivate a Jewish person to do their job? And that's what Christ was there to do. Guys, do your job. Go to the Gentiles. So now, Acts chapter 9. Paul's on his way to Damascus. He's on his way to Damascus because he wants to get those people that were worshiping Christ as the Messiah, because in Paul's mind, and we're going to get to that, and I don't know if we're going to get to that today or not, in his mind, Christ was an imposter, and those who followed him were just as much as an imposter. And the reason Paul didn't like Christ was because he claimed to be God. We're going to see that. And that was the line. All right, so he's on his way to Damascus. God blinds him. And then God sends this guy named Ananias to go and give him the sight back. And Ananias was like, uh, no. <laughs> that guy's going to kill me. I want nothing to do with him. And in Acts 9, 13, it says, And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many, by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. That's a true statement. What was he doing to those people in Jerusalem? Thrown in jail and what else? Killing them. Okay with full authority of the Roman government behind him. Because Christ claimed also to be the king of the Jews. In order to be the king of the Jews, who had to get kicked out of Jerusalem and kicked out of Israel? 
the Romans, right? And so because of that, Rome went, all right, anybody who wants to stand up against Caesar, we'll kill them too. So the Roman government had no problem with what Paul was doing, okay? And, hath, and he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Or basically he could have Ananias arrested too. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before. Now, people look at this and go, Aha! This is a different order than what the Great Commission was. Bear my name before what? Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, I look at this and go, Is there anything wrong with the Jews going to a Gentile? No. Now, it's a different order than God gave the 12, and we're going to look at that order in a second. But that, the 12 were what? They were the ruling authority, little flock, 12 tribes sitting on the 12 thrones, judging, you know, all that. They were a leadership. Is Paul part of the 12 disciples? No. no. Now, some people want to make him one of the 12. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but he was a Jew. Okay, and Paul was a very important Jew. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he, he was pretty high up. And is there anything wrong with a Jew going to a Gentile? No. So let's say there never was a dispensation of grace. And I know we can't do that, but for the sake of my discussion, let's say there wasn't. Does this still work? Yes. Yeah. Does it work like 80% or 30? 100 the Jews were always supposed to go to the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, okay? Now, he goes on. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. Is this only something that happens under grace? That people suffer for Christ's name? No. Uh, the twelve. <laughs> did they suffer? Yeah, well, of course they did. All right, so we, we can't go to Acts 9 and say, oh, this is something new. Because it's, it's not there. Now, what a lot of people do is they anticipate revelation, which is against progressive revelation 100%. You cannot anticipate something somebody doesn't know. Okay? Now, let's jump back to Acts, Acts 1. Okay? This is when Christ spent 40 days talking to his disciples before he went back up into heaven. So this is after his death, after his burial, after his resurrection. And he's talking to the twelve. And he says, When he had therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel. I always love the fact that um, this word again is in there. If you use the word again, you know, like, are we going to McDonald's again? With a question mark. Does, that in, it implies we've been there what? Before. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So what kingdom are they talking about? You're right. Danny's right. <clears throat> They're talking about the good old days of David and probably Solomon, you know, in that time when Israel, what? Pretty much ruled the world, okay? And so they're wanting to know, hey, now, is he also, are they also asking about this thousand-year kingdom? Yeah, but that's not, they're, they're not thinking that far. They just want Christ to be the king. They want to restore what was going on back. They want the good old days. How's that, okay? Now, that's a good question. And then we get into this, um, you know, the kenosis theory where, well, Jesus didn't know anything. <laughs> I think Jesus Christ, when he was in the, you know, swaddling clothes, lying in the manger, understood everything, but yet he had to cry. You know that? Why did Jesus cry rather than say, hey, Mother Mary, I'm hungry. <laughs> I would have terrified him. Yeah, I, oh, wow, that's a good, I never thought of that way. I th what was his limitation when he was a one-day-old baby? His goofy physical body, <laughs> okay? He hadn't, although I do think he probably uh, was the fastest uh, as far as understanding things and knowledge and comprehension because he was God, but his limitation was his body. And that's why I think Jesus cried. Now, it says he never sinned. Do babies ever cry for selfish reasons, Robin? <laughs> Do adults ever cry? <laughs> you know, yeah. Do you think Jesus ever cried because he wanted attention? Yes. I, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, uh, well, then it wouldn't have been for selfish reasons other than, hey, mom, I'm wet. <laughs> you know? I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, it's, it, it's his limiting factor was his body. 
you know. But I do think he probably talked at a very young age. He probably was smarter than most kids because he was, you know, God and he, he was whoever he was. But we don't have any lot of records of that time. But I do think the worst thing to be would be one of his siblings later on because Mary had other kids. Because I'll guarantee you, you know, you, when your first kid turns out really good, what do you always think? The second one's going to be a breeze, right? And it turns out your second one is the son of Satan. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, well, the first one was so easy. It never cried, never complained, never got colicky. Now this one, it's like the never sleeps. He, I, I don't know. But I'm sure, this is my joke of the day. I'm sure Mary said to her other kids all the time, why can't you be more like Jesus? Okay. Of which they probably said, <laughs> yeah. It's amazing you didn't end up like Joseph. Yeah. Okay. All right. Acts 1 8. So. They ask Christ this question, which I think is a good question. It's like, okay, kingdom, 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 because they want that kingdom to come, okay? And this is what Christ said. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, do you think Jesus also could have said, well, guys, we got a little problem, because see, Israel's going to be set aside because you guys are idiots, and we're going to raise up this new dispensation called the Dispensation of Grace, so get over it. Do you think Christ knew that answer too? Nope. I think he did. I actually do think he did. Uh, James, James said no. And my reason for that is because if somebody breaks into your house and says, where is your money? Do you tell them? He said nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't lie, did he? he said, My only. Yeah, he didn't lie. Well, he said Father only, but Christ and God the Father are the same. They were connected by the Holy Spirit. I think he knew more than he was saying. You know, but the point is, it wasn't for them to know. You know, it, any of you seen the movie Back to the Future? <laughs> Does knowing the future cause trouble? <laughs> yeah. And again, they had to experience it themselves. It, it's just because Christ knew it doesn't mean he had to tell them. Because there was, you know, yeah, a lot of things going on there. But this is what he tells them that I think is more important. He said, you shall receive power when, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, remember, when Ananias was talking to God, and God told him what Paul was going to do, it's almost like the opposite order, because he says, you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This is like a ripple effect. And you look at this, and, and the twelve follow this very, very well. Is Jerusalem Jewish? Yeah. And what basically what Christ was saying is once the city of Jerusalem is converted, and, and I don't know if he was talking 100%, but I think he was talking more than what we had in the early part of Acts. Let's say 90%. When 90% of Jerusalem, and one, one person told me, well, he was talking about the leadership. When the leadership finally comes around, then you can go to Judea. Now, is Judea Jewish? Yes. Yep. How much? 100? Close to it, right? Finally, then, when you take it from Jerusalem and you get them converted and then you get Judea converted and they all, they all become members of the little flock, then you can go to Samaria. Is Samaria Jewish? Partly. Yeah, it's like half and half. Those are those half breeds, okay? They weren't purebreds, okay? And then we get to the uttermost parts of the earth. What is that? Is that Gentile or Jewish? Gentile. Right. So God is telling them, guys, we're going to take this kingdom message to the world. Isn't that what he's saying? Yeah. I think he is. Okay. But we're going to do it in a systematic order. In fact, they always tell you, uh, and we're not going to go there, but if you read on your own, Acts 1.8, you also should go to Acts 8.1. Because when Paul is persecuting the Christians and they all run away in Acts 8, the 12 don't leave. They stay in Jerusalem. And there are people who say, that's why God had to raise up Paul, because the twelve wouldn't leave and go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So then God raised up Paul, and he is the one who fulfilled that great commission. I'm like, no. The twelve knew that Jerusalem had to come first. Now, was Jerusalem slowly coming around? Not really, but we did have some success. We had thousands and thousands of people. But when I say, had did the leadership ever come around? No. That, that's your problem, I think, more than anything else, is the leadership. All right, Matthew 28. Is that a good grace verse? No. Nope. This, this is our great commission, right? Isn't that where we go for this? <laughs> no. This is the kingdom great commission. Christ is talking to whom? Well, he's talking to the 12. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Okay, so now he's talking to the twelve, and the twelve represent what? The nation, the nation of Israel. Because God, Christ told the twelve what? Don't go to the Jews, but he also told them it's God's pleasure to give what? The kingdom to you. So who's, if, if God's going to give the leadership of the kingdom to the twelve, who did he take it away from? Does anybody know? From the uh, chief priests. Right, from the Pharisees and Sadducees and the pre chief priests. They lost their authority and he's giving it to the twelve. So he says, all right, I want you guys to go and teach all nations. Now, would that be Jewish or Gentiles? Gentiles. See, Gentiles, there's always been a plan of salvation for the Gentiles, but the Jews, they didn't like Gentiles. Do you think that Peter liked Gentiles? What do you think? In the beginning? No. no. I think he hated them. Why? Because every Jew hated the Gentiles. If you go into Palestine and you ask any Palestinian what they think of the Jews, what will, they tell, what will they tell you? They're dogs. They're dogs. Now, where did they learn that from? From the Jews. Well, not from the Jews. They learned it from their parents, okay? That's, that's one of the problems is these kids are taught from the day they're born, the Jews are dogs and they all need to what? Be dead. Be dead. In fact, all, all these countries, Iran, um, you know, uh, all these Muslim countries want to do one thing to the nation of Israel. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah annihilate them. You know, and they have said, if we have a ceasefire and we regroup, we're going to go back in and do this again. They have one goal in their, in their whole entire lifetime, and they pass it on to the next generation. The next generation is, if you ever get a chance, annihilate the Jews. That's what they want to do. But unfortunately, this is not what that's talking about. This is the other way. The Jews were told to go to all of the nations and to basically to turn them into kingdom saints or turn them into proselytes. But how good of a job were they doing? They're not doing it, <laughs> doing it at all. In fact, like Jonah, they would rather go the other way. That's the problem with, in a sense, that Christ came to earth for. He came but to the lost sheep. Why were they lost? They weren't doing their job. So if you, if you understand that, it's not that Acts 9 will make sense to you, but Acts 10 will make a lot more sense to you. So this is the Great Commission. We're going to go to all the world and we're going to baptize them. That's water in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. It's the Jews doing their job, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. All right, now we get to Acts 10. We're going to spend a lot of time here this morning. Does Acts 10 take place after Acts 9? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. I have to say that for a reason because some people are like, so if you start the church, the body of Christ, in Acts 9, and that everybody who's alive is now in the body, <coughs> it means that Peter needs to start teaching grace, right? Because there's no kingdom program available. And I look at that and I go, show me. I, I don't believe the body of Christ even started until Acts 13. Uh, I think Paul was saved into the kingdom program and God moved him into the body of Christ in Acts 13. And I don't think Peter has a clue, but Peter has a problem. If Peter is part of this great commission, going into all the world, and he runs into a Gentile, is that Gentile brought into the kingdom program or brought into the body of Christ? In Acts 10, there only is one program available. It has to be kingdom. But people look at this and go, no, no, Peter taught Cornelius grace. They went, really? Let's look at it. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius. A centurion of the band is called the Italian band. So we have a Gentile man, okay? A devout man and one that feared God with all of his house who gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So this is a guy who was, we call these people seekers, okay? I think that's a little bit important here. He was seeking God, okay? And that's always important, okay? He saw in a vision eventually about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in and saying into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up as a memorial before God. So Cornelius was probably praying for more insight and more information. Or in the sense he was saying, how, how do I get saved, I guess, more than anything else. James? He became one, but at this point he is a, uns I'd say he's an unsaved Gentile that is seeking God. Okay? And we're going to see, I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Okay? And now send men to Joppa, 
and call him on Simon, whose surname is Peter. So he says, all right, guys, I want you to go find Peter, and Peter is going to give you more information, okay? He lodged with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So Cornelius is seeking God, and God says, hey, you go find Peter, and Peter's going to tell you, all right? <clears throat> and when the angel which spoke unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow, as they were on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now again, if you're looking for God to talk to you today through prayers and visions and signs, you're in the wrong dispensation. Okay, This is not happening today, but it was definitely happening then. This is God getting Peter's attention and talking to him. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Don't you hate that when you're so hungry that you fall into a trance? And he saw heaven open, that was sarcasm, and a certain vessel descending upon him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. So he, he basically is seeing a vision, and there's this huge sheet that's coming down from heaven, and there's you know people hanging on to it, or angels hanging on to it in the four corners, and it's just this giant cavity in the middle, okay? And what was inside that? All right. Wherein were all manners of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, Peter, people look at this and go, Well, what God is trying to teach Peter is that the food laws are also being set aside in the dispensation of grace. Now, that is a true statement, but that's not what's going on here, okay? God is not telling Peter that he's taking away the food laws. God never took away anything from the kingdom saints. He never changed the food laws. That's like people today say, the, the Sabbath used to be on Sunday, and now the Christian Sabbath is what day? Or on Saturday, I'm sorry. And now the Christian Sabbath is what? Sunday. God never changed the Sabbath. It's always been Saturday you know, evening to Sunday evening. Uh, why do Christians... I'm sorry, Friday night to Saturday night. Why do Christians worship on Sunday if God didn't change the Sabbath? Anybody know? Resurrection. Resurrection. But is, that, is there a law that we have to meet on Sundays? No. no. So why do we meet on Sundays? Well, we, want to. we want to. That's good. It's the most convenient for most people. Because most people are off on Sundays. Until, until football came along, until uh, soccer came along, until every other sport known to man came along until fishing came along, and now that's a competition. <laughs> but, but years ago, when my parents were growing up, what was open on Sunday mornings? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because that's when you went to church. And nowadays, it's almost like people are doing the opposite. They think of things to do on Sunday. All right, so Peter is totally misunderstanding what God is saying. He thinks God's telling him to you know, either trick him or something, that he can go ahead and eat things that are, are banned, from the food laws, okay? Go ahead and eat pork, Peter. It's okay. Go ahead and have shrimp. It's really tasty. You know, and Peter's like, uh, no. You can't trick me, God. I know what you're up to. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, Three times means, you know, hey, it's, it's a done deal. So Peter's like, okay, I still don't get it, <laughs> okay? And while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, what does that mean? Peter still doesn't know what God's trying to teach him, okay? Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. All of a sudden it's like a... And Peter says, oh, there's a bunch of Gentiles standing out there, <laughs> okay? Now, again, what was Peter's attitude towards Gentiles? <laughs> They're dogs. We're not going to go out of our way to do anything nice for a Gentile because we don't like them. Again, it had nothing to do with being biblical. It had to do with his upbringing, I think, more than anything else, okay? And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. So now we have all these things that are falling into place. These guys are like, hey, we're looking for Peter. And, and, and Peter's probably thinking, how do they know I'm even here? And I think what's happening is all these things are going off in Peter's head, 
and he finally is putting two and two together. God wasn't talking about unclean animals. He was talking about unclean people. He said, what God says is clean is clean. I, talk to these people, Peter. I'm telling you, you're supposed to talk to them. That's all that God was trying to teach Peter there more than anything else. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Everything is now falling into place. Okay, God is working with people. Again, I said before, if you had to play chess, chess with God, God wouldn't cheat, but he would win. Why would he win? He knows everything that there is to know. And, and he knows from studying you what your moves are going to be, and I guarantee he probably could tell you what your moves are going to be. Not because he made you move, because he knows you. Does God know Peter's doubts? Oh, yeah. Better than Peter knows them. The same thing. Did God know Paul's problem on the roads of Damascus? Yeah. He knew that the only way to get Paul converted was to prove to him that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was the Son of God, and he was not a fake. And so, boom, Christ shows up, and, and Paul's like, Oops, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> Everything fell into place. And that's all that God is doing here is he's, he's helping Peter understand Gentiles are okay to talk to. Now, then we, that's, this hurdle is fine. The next hurdle that a lot of grace people have is what did Peter teach Cornelius? Did he teach him grace or did he teach him kingdom? Peter went down to the men which stood unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seeketh. What is the cause where am you have come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews. I find that interesting. You know, he likes you guys, okay? And they like you. Was warned of God by a holy angel to send for thee unto this house to hear the words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So now this whole caravan goes back to Cornelius, and he talks to him. And on the morrow after they had entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Isn't that kind of neat? He's like calling all of his friends together and says, hey, we're going to, God's sending someone to talk to us. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up, saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. He had a whole group. And he said unto them, You know how that it is unlawful thing that a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, I look at this verse here in verse 28. And he says, You know it's unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Is that a true statement? Yes, it was. No. Whose law was it? Man's law. Man's law. Yeah. It, it had... Pharisees, that's probably good. It, it had been ingrained in the Jews so deeply that as far as Peter was concerned, he had just broke a bunch of laws. And again, it was man, God never said, don't, don't go to the, Matthew 28, he says, I want you to go to all the nations. And now, he made him separate. Well, he made them separate. But, yeah, yeah, their separate was, that means that we want you all to die and, and go to hell. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, he's a signifying two different groups. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, but when I look at this and I go, they, they make it sound like it's part of the, the no, mosaic no. law. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mean, God said be separate. Right. He didn't say, and go out and marry them all and intermarry with them. He didn't say that. But it, it's like, it's kind of like when we go and talk to unsaved people. It doesn't mean we have to partake in what they're doing. It just means we need to talk to them. Because if you're waiting around for unsaved people to come up to you and start knocking at your door and asking you how to be saved, it ain't going to happen. Okay? It's the same thing with the Jews. You know, they, if, if the Gentiles were going to be saved, the Jews were going to have to go to them. Now, here's a, a unique situation where a Gentile is coming to Peter. I, I, I know that. But it's usually the other way around. Okay? But... But God has showed me, when did, when did God show him that? The day before, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that I should not call any man common or unclean. Or he's saying, uh, uh, I guess that's not a law, <laughs> is what he's trying to say. Um, so it, it has nothing to do with the food laws. 
It has to do with the people laws. <laughs> this is what he's trying to tell them. So, so did God ever take away the food laws from the nation of Israel according to Acts chapter 10? No, that's not what he's talking about there. But he's using that as an example to help Peter understand it. And it worked. It worked real well. <laughs> Therefore came I unto you without gang saying, as soon as I was sent. For I asked, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. Now again, Peter ran into trouble when he, when he went back home. You guys know that. <laughs> they got all over him. <laughs> so he's like, okay, why am I here? <laughs> and Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And so Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent for thee, and thou hast done well that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here, present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So they basically tell us what we need to know. You know, this is a guy who wants to know more. In a sense, he wants to know how to be saved, we'll say. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, again, did God ever hate Gentiles? It's like, no. But in Peter's mind, he's still struggling with that. Is, I guess God loves you guys too. Oh, I guess I was wrong. That's what he's basically saying. And in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, you look at this and you go, okay. Now, when Peter says your worketh righteousness, does that sound gracy or a little bit lawy? No. It sounds like law, okay. But it's hard to read into that one. But he's saying, you know, you fear God, do good things, and then God will like you. And again, basically Cornelius was doing that. He was giving alms, he was praying, he was seeking God. And God rewarded him for that. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. all right, now we're going to start getting to what I call the kingdom message. Okay? What does it mean when you preach Jesus Christ? Well, you don't know. That's a pretty vague statement. Okay? I say, you know that, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So now we're getting back to... John's baptism that he preached. What was John's baptism? Repent. Repent and be baptized for remission of sins. Did John teach that Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried and rose again? Never even brought it up. Okay. Kingdom of, kingdom of heaven is here. You had to, you know, repent, which is, you know, change your attitude, change your mind about God, start doing God's will. And this is a kingdom. He's giving them the kingdom message. Okay. Because John's message was Christ is the Messiah, he's the Son of God. That's what John taught him. You can't say yet that we have anything gracy here, although we're going to get to a part where people say he did. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. And grace people jump on this and go, oh, now he's getting to the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's, that's, he's giving him a fact here, okay? I do not believe he's giving him the grace message. He's telling him a fact. Just like, do you believe that Christ is the Messiah? I do. Do you believe he's the king? I do. Do you believe he's the son of God? I do. Guess what? I've just given you the kingdom message. Are you now in the kingdom program? No. It's not even valid today, okay? Now, again... If, if grace didn't start, uh, uh, you know, until Acts 13, which I believe it did, and Paul was the first person into the body of Christ, and there's no body of Christ active yet, he, he, there's nothing available here. This, he's teaching them a fact, okay? Guess what? They killed the Messiah. Duh. Everyone knows that. Him God raised up the third day, showed him openly. Oh, we have death, we have burial, we have resurrection. Yeah, as a fact, it's not, the, it's not the gospel he's giving them. He's giving them the fact that they killed the Messiah. Not to all the people, but unto witness, witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. We say, yeah, I know he's alive because I was with him. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To give... And him gave all the prophets witnesses that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. 
if this is the closest we're going to get to the grace gospel, which is, he's basically giving him the gospel here, okay? Through his name, whosoever believeth in him. Now that's like John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever, what, believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Does that verse save you into the dispensation of the grace of God? No. no. But what do most people do? Well, what that means is you have to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Well, that's not what that verse says. Nope. But we Paulinize it enough that we make it grace. What he's give, remember, remember when Christ asked Peter, you know, hey, who do people say I am? He's like, oh, they say you're Isaiah, Jeremiah, whatever. And then Christ's like, well, no, Peter, who, who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, thou art the Son of the living God. That was Peter's testimony. And Christ was like, thank you. That's the gospel. This is, a king, this is a good kingdom gospel. Through Christ's name, if you believe in him, that he is what? The Son of God. You're saved in the kingdom program. Peter's giving Cornelius a good kingdom gospel here. Now, is there any problem with a Gentile being saved? No, and that's why we call them proselytes. Okay? Now, what's the definition of a proselyte? Okay? It's a Gentile that what? Believes. Believes. Okay? Does that make him a Jew? Nope. nope. But it makes him saved. And it means that he's a friend of Jesus or a friend of the Jews. Or it, it, it's, it's, it's that trickle-down thing. I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. It makes him part of the blessing side. I don't believe a Gentile ever could become a Jew, but they sure could become the, the benefit of those same blessings. So, again, I think he's giving them a good kingdom message and, and things are good. Okay, Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Who's all of them? The people he just gave this, this, this message to. All those Gentile people came upon them, okay? Uh-oh, okay, all right. Now, again, at the moment of salvation, I get the Holy Spirit, so what's the big deal? Okay, now. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many of them came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, what, why was that so weird? Well, they hadn't been baptized, but also the Jews didn't think Gentiles were even savable or could be saved, <laughs> or wanted them saved. And so this is a whole, this is like blow up your mind type stuff. But again, God always told the Jews they were supposed to go to the Gentiles. There's always been a message to the Gentiles, but the Jews had morphed it to the point to where I think they thought their Gentiles couldn't even be saved if they wanted to. But they were just like, sorry, it's not available. You're not the right you know, line. You don't follow Abraham. So now we have the Holy Ghost coming out on them. Now your answer is, well, how do, they, how do they know that? Okay, This is how they knew it. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter. So all of these Gentiles are starting to speak in tongues. Now how many of you, when you believe that Christ died on the cross, started jabbering, you don't raise your hand, started <laughs> jabbering in tongues? <laughs> this is, this Scott is like, don't let me raise my hand. I hope the answer is none of you did. Why? Because that's not part of grace, is it? No. Now again, <laughs> yeah, there are people who have been told that unless you speak in tongues, you're not saved. And so they jabble, jabble something out and they go, oh, I have the second blessings. You know? And Paul goes through a whole list of rules when you're going to speak in tongues, you have to have interpreters and everybody can't be yapping at one time. And no one follows that because that, that would make too much sense. You know what the purpose of tongues was? The purpose of tongues is not for the saved. Do you guys know that? The purpose of tongues is for the unsaved. As, as the, the Jews and proselytes, wherever it is, would go out to other nations, goes back to the Tower of Babel, the number one problem they're going to have is language. How do you talk to somebody who don't know their language? Again, I've said this before, if you want to be a missionary to wherever, first thing they do is they send you to language school. How long does language school take? Depends. Depends. How long do you think language school would take for me? For, forget it. Don't even go. Dave, you've got to find an English-speaking country. All right, we're going to go to Belize. <laughs> it can take time. I don't do, how long do people go to language school, Denny? Do you know? I mean, it takes months, doesn't it? Or Most of the time it's six months. Six months to a year. Yeah, but 
Imagine if you could show up and talk in anybody's language. That that would not be an issue. Without being taught. Without being taught. And I think in, if you go to being a part of Acts, you don't have to even know how to say it. They hear it in their language. <laughs> you know, when Peter spoke at Pentecost, everybody heard him in their known language, even though Peter was probably speaking in Greek. Just one just, it was a miracle. That Tongues is a miracle. These guys are all speaking in tongues. That's how they knew the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they're like, okay, th this is not right. And I think, you know, here's what, can any man forbid water? Now they're thinking, we haven't even water baptized these people yet. I, I really think, and, and this, this might be a little bit of raw meat, I really think the reason that they spoke in tongues before they were water baptized is because I don't think those Jews would have water baptized them otherwise. Because <laughs> they're like, nope, can't do it. You guys are Gentiles. You're unsavable. I don't even know why we're here. I don't know. Can any man forbid water? What's the answer to that? Uh, no, <laughs> we have to. That these should not be baptized. So what'd they do? They baptized them, okay? Now, if you were a grace believer, how many mistakes did Peter make here? <laughs> Where do you want to start, okay? First of all, he didn't explain the grace message very well. He just said Christ died and he rose again. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and you guys got to show good works, basically. And he told them you got to believe in Christ. It, it's like, I, so to go here and say, now we have the grace message being brought to Gentiles. I'm like, that's the poorest example of a grace message I've ever seen. Now, to say that Peter is now taking the Great Commission finally and doing something with it, I have no problem with that at all. At all. He commanded them to be baptized. Of course, that was spirit baptism, right? No, it was water from one end to the other. In the name of the Lord, then prayed the hymn to tarry certain days. Um, <clears throat> Grace believers never were given physical gifts. I don't even believe during the transition that a grace believer was given any of these supernatural gifts. I think those were spillovers from kingdom saints who still were part of the kingdom program that had these gifts of tongues and things like that. That's why the Corinthian church, and we're going to get to that, not this week, we're going to get to it next week. The Corinthian church had more kingdom saints in it probably than grace believers because most of them came from the synagogue right next door. And as they were saved, they had all these supernatural gifts. I don't see anywhere where a true grace believer was given any supernatural gifts of tongues or healing or things like that. I think that was reserved for the kingdom program. And they were diminishing. Um, but that this kingdom saints had the promise of these gifts. That's why these guys had the gifts of tongues and things like that. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we start looking at these things, it's Acts is a book of Israel. Israel being set aside. Although we see the body of Christ, Lord, it's, it's Israel rejecting you over and over again. And by the time we get to Acts 28, it's done. And nobody was added to that kingdom program. Lord, we thank you for your long-suffering. You, you show that same long-suffering to us, too. And we thank you for grace. Lord, you took our punishment on the cross, and we thank you for that. You died on the cross for our sins. You were buried and you rose again. And Lord, we pray that anyone listening this morning is trusting in you alone for their salvation and not their good works or so-called good works. We thank you again for salvation. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, folks.